Um, this is the title page. Public. We're going to be discussing today publishing. E <clears throat> excuse me. Publishing EPS images to both PDF and HTML outputs. Um, it's somewhat of a specific topic, but uh, obviously, if it's something that you need to do, then hopefully, it'll be very useful for you. Um, it's uh, it's not that complicated once you know how to do it. But today, we'll go through step by step exactly how to use EPS images. First of all, what EPS images are, um, and and why you would want to use them, and and uh, and then how to go about using them in publishing. Uh, before we get there, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, my background is in computer science as well as some education. Uh, I've had experience in several computer companies over the past decade, um, as well as some finance companies, uh, programming web applications, server-side applications, client-side applications, uh, a whole variety of different applications. And I was an early member of the Sweet Solutions team. I started off programming PDF and HTML style sheet projects. I've uh, moved up, some might say, to project management, dealing with CMS integration. I've taken part in a number of on-site and online training seminars, uh, webinars, as well as multi-day seminars uh, on-site at various clients throughout the US. Um, a little bit about Sweet Solutions. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, our vision is to enable companies to engage their customers by providing quick access to relevant information. Uh, that information can come in various forms, PDF, HTML. Um, we have a lot of experience with HTML5, EPUBs, mobile help, uh, dynamic publishing. Um, a lot of that is mentioned here. Uh, in a lot of different industries, uh, high tech that both software and, uh, and hardware, aerospace and defense, healthcare, discrete manufacturing, uh, mining companies, uh, you name it. Um, we have a, a very interesting customer base. And between our staff, we have hundreds of person years of experience on the staff. We work very well together as a team and, uh, and our clients, I think, see the benefit of that partnership that we have internally. Okay. Moving on to the actual subject matter now, uh, this is a, a general outline of what we'll be discussing today. First, we'll talk about what is an EPS file, uh, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of using the EPS format. And then we'll move on to hands-on practical, how do you publish with EPS files, EPS images, both to PDF and to HTML. First, what is an EPS file? And here I, I copied from Wikipedia. Uh, again, if you're on this webinar, you probably know what an EPS file is already. Um, the, the title was not that engaging that you'd say, I, I have no idea what that means, but it sounds like something I, I must know something about. Um, so you probably know what an EPS file is, but just uh, for the record, it's an encapsulated PostScript file, which is a DSC conforming PostScript document with additional restrictions, which is intended to be usable as a graphics file format. So essentially, it's a, it's a form of graphics file. In other words, it's a more or less self-contained, reasonably predictable PostScript document that describes an image or drawing and can be placed within another PostScript document. So it's an image file. It's a form of image file. And what this definition doesn't give, uh, which is perhaps most significant, is that it's a vector-based image file, as opposed to, for example, uh, JPEGs, PNGs, TIFFs, uh, bitmaps, you know, BMPs, um, which literally map out more or less pixel by pixel what color each pixel should be. Uh, Vector-based images describe shapes. There should be a circle in this point you know, with, with this center and this radius and this color. Um, the advantage of vector-based images is that they are um, at least theoretically infinitely sharp, and we'll get there soon. But another critical detail of EPS files is that they frequently include a preview picture of the content for on-screen display. And the idea here is to allow a simple preview of the final output in any application that can draw a bitmap. Without this preview, the applications would have to directly render the PostScript data inside the EPS which was beyond the capability of most machines until recently. Um, and it's still beyond the capability of some pieces of software, I would add. What that basically means is that often EPS files will contain both this very sharp, um, very usable vector-based image, but will also include within the same file a bitmap that approximates the same image, just so that applications that might not be able to render the vector-based image will still be able to show you give you a basic idea of what this image is supposed to look like. And we'll see an example of that as we proceed. 
So what exactly are the advantages of EPS images? As I mentioned, and, and this is true, in, again, of really of any vector-based image, um, EPS being one of the more popular ones, although SVGs are another popular format with its own advantages. Um, it's vector-based, and that, again, makes them infinitely sharp and zoomable in theory. And what that means is that if you have a, a PDF that has an EPS in it, you can zoom in as far as you want, and that curve will still look like a curve rather than a bunch of jagged pixels. Um, and that makes them great for PDFs where people will often zoom in on their screen and make them bigger and, and want to see things more clearly. But it also makes them specifically great for PDFs that you plan to print uh, because you don't have to worry about what DPI should I use in 72 DPI, 96 DPI, 300 DPI. You have your vector-based image, and however you want to print it, um, it will come out sharp, assuming, again, that you're using it properly. Uh, let's take a look at exactly what that looks like. Uh, what you should see here on the screen right now are two images. On the left is a JPEG, and on the right is an EPS image. It says .pdf on top. That's a, a quirk of this Mac software for some reason. That's labeling, labeling it as .pdf, but it was actually in .eps when I first opened it. It must be some sort of runtime conversion that it does. And at this resolution, they look exactly the same. Uh, we can't really tell the difference. Um, certainly not over GoToWebinar. You're, you're not going to see any difference. But if I were to zoom in on both of them, which I've already done, excuse me. Um, if I zoom in, and again, on the left is the JPEG, and the right is the EPS, hopefully here you can see this even through GoToWebinar, that the JPEG, and this is true of JPEGs in particular because they are what's known as lossy, um, which means that due to the compression, there are artifacts. Excuse me. You can see that when we zoom in on the JPEG, you can clearly see pixels. You can clearly see how things have been literally mapped again, almost pixel by pixel in the file, and therefore you can see individual pixels, whereas the EPS, when we zoom in, these lines are still sharp, the lines are still clear, and that would be true no matter how far we zoomed in, if it's a well-made EPS. And that's the very clear advantage of EPS files over, over uh, raster-based images or, or bitmapped images. So the advantage is clear, uh, but generally speaking, when there are advantages, there are disadvantages. Otherwise, everyone would be using them. So what are the disadvantages of using EPS images? So with regard to EPS images in particular, generally speaking, the file sizes are pretty large. There's a lot of information there really describing the shapes. Um, it obviously depends on how they're designed and what shapes they're describing. But EPS images can, can be you know, several to dozens of, of megabytes um, for just a regular sized image. Uh, and that actually notably is, is larger than, than uh, SVGs, the other vector-based image format that I mentioned before. Um, but the main disadvantage, and the one that we're going to address today, is that there's a relatively poor support among publishing workflow tools. And that means that, for example, Antenna House, which is used by, I would say, the overwhelming majority of our clients to create their PDFs, by default, does not support EPS images in the way that I've described. Certainly FOP, which is the free PDF rendering engine that comes with the DITOT, does not support EPS images and cannot output them into a PDF. Browsers, web browsers, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, Internet Explorer, uh, probably any other that ones that you can name, do not support EPS images. Uh, based on what I found online and my experimentation, there are no browsers that support EPS images. And that's obviously a problem because here's a great image format that gives you infinite sharpness, at least in your PDFs, but you can't use it anywhere. So you can gain from that adva those advantages. So the question is, how can we get the benefits of EPS image format while still being able to use them in our regular output formats, in our PDF and our HTML output formats? And the answer, in short, to, to both of those, PDF and HTML, is to use a third-party tool called GhostScript. Um, GhostScript is an interpreter for the PostScript language and for PDF. Um, it is available uh, for free. 
Um, I don't know the, the exact nature of the license, but it is some sort of uh, general public license, I believe. Um, not my area of expertise. It is available for download at www.ghostscript.com. And it is a, a capable of reading and rendering EPS images. And it's also capable of being incorporated into your workflow, uh, your Ditto OT workflow, to allow for inclusion of EPS images in both PDF and HTML outputs in, uh, in two different ways, as we'll see. Uh, first, let's talk about EPS images. And here we're going to focus specifically on Antenna House. As I mentioned, FOP is the free rendering engine that comes with the Ditto OT. FOP does not support the rendering of EPS images, period, uh, almost period. It supports the rendering of EPS images if the output that you're generating is a PostScript file. So if you're doing that, great. But if you're creating a PDF directly, at least, um, it does not support it. So that's sort of um, beyond hope to some degree. But as I said, the, the overwhelming majority of our clients at least use Antenna House, and I, I know that it's one of the more popular, most popular uh, tools in this field. Uh, and therefore, what we're going to discuss today is how to use ghost script together with antenna house to include eps files in your pdf output so excuse me one second <clears throat> and here i'd like to show you the code uh, because i think really nothing's going to drive it home as much as actually seeing the code seeing how it's done uh, it's surprisingly little code so let's uh let's take a look um, I've developed this code as a plugin to the Ditto OT. In this case, in particular, Ditto OT 1.7.3. But presumably something similar could be done regardless of your Ditto OT version, at least for some of the newer versions. Um, I don't know if the same code would work if you're still on 1.4.3, but at least for the newer versions, uh, this plugin is the way to do it. Um, so I've created two separate plugins, as you'll already see here, one for HTML output, and another for PDF output. And I've done my best here to ensure that all of the code is self-contained within these plugins. That is to say, if you were to take this PDF plugin and install it in your Ditto OT right now, it would work. There would be no, um, aside from the installation of GhostScript, which I mentioned before, that's something that needs to be done uh, externally. Uh, you don't need to configure path variables or, or class path or, or other environment variables to get all this working libraries you'll see here there's a, there is one library but i've included that here um, whether you choose to do it this way to have it all self-encapsulated is a uh, is a judgment call um, but uh, but at least for the purposes of this demonstration i thought that having everything self-contained would be a very good proof of concept to show how it all comes together uh, i see roger asked what about render x uh, the truth is I, i'm not sure about render x um, i don't know whether that supports EPS images, but that's something that I can look into and get back to you. So let's start with PDF. Uh, and you can already see based on the limited number of files here, and you'll see that the files are, are probably even smaller than you would imagine them to be, um, that this is uh, surprisingly straightforward if you know what to do. Um, if you don't know what to do, it can take you a lot of time to figure it out. But if you know what to do, as we'll see, it, uh, it goes very smoothly. Uh, so as with any good plugin, the PDF plugin starts with a plugin.xml file. And if we take a look at that, uh, what we see here is that the PDF plugin, it requires the PDF2 plugin, of course, because we're generating PDF2 output. And it simply says that we're going to include um, integrator.xml within, uh, within our ant code base. Uh, this code will be available after the webinar to anyone who wants it, so you don't have to worry about scrambling to copy this down or take screenshots, um, the code will be available uh, to anyone who, uh, who requests it. Um, so we simply integrate integrator.xml into our ant code base. And if we look at integrator.xml, which is in the same directory, uh, we see that we've chosen to override one target, the target that actually uses Antenna House to create our PDF file. Um, most of this is unchanged. Uh, the line here, the, the, certainly the name, uh, the unless, this is all unchanged. Line 12 is also unchanged. 
uh, lines 17 through 26 are unchanged. What we've added here, aside from the comments, are lines 14 and 15 up here and 29 and 30 down here. Let's take a look at what these do. Uh, line 14 modifies our path, and this is what I mentioned before. You could theoretically do this in your start command.bat, uh, but I wanted to make it all self-contained. And it adds our ghost script installation to our path variable. Uh, in this particular case, I have GhostScript 8.6.4 installed on my machine. They're already up to 9. something. Um, but I've chosen to hard code that in here because I know what I have installed. In theory, if you wanted to, you could probably make this some sort of dynamic detection, uh, similar to what the Ditto OT does for Antenna House, where it tries to figure out which version of Antenna House you have installed and use the latest version. You could probably do the same thing here. There probably is not much need to do so, and it would take more time than it's worth. So we add ghost script, the binary directory, to our path. Um, optionally, we set this environment variable, gs underscore options, of use CIE color. Uh, ghost script has the option to use CIE color. I don't know exactly offhand. I don't recall what the CIE stands for. But it essentially uh, sets a certain setting within ghost script that allows for more accurate color conversions between CMYK and RGB palettes. This makes the processing of the EPS images take longer. We generally don't include this line for our clients because most of our clients don't have a need for that degree of accurate color rendering. Um, and as I said, it does make things take a little bit longer. Uh, if you don't include this line, you'll get a, a warning in the antenna house processing that says use, set the UCIE color argument for proper use of the you know, CMYK palette conversion or, or something like that. But it's simply a warning or, or maybe even more of an info, I would consider it, because there's no harm done if you don't include this line. It just means that your greens might not quite be so green and your blues might not quite be so blue, but not to any degree that any of our clients have ever noticed or at least had issue with. After setting those environment variables, all we have to do is tell Antenna House to use a settings file in the rendering. All of these are arguments to Antenna House. Again, this is part of the basic did OT. We tell it which topic FO file to, to take in, <clears throat> excuse me, which output file to generate. That's going to be the name of a PDF file. To use the PDF uh, rendering engine uh, and so on, this has to do with uh, font conversion, um, font embedding, and uh, error levels. But what we've added here is we've told it to use a particular settings file, Antenna House supports settings files that include a, a, a tremendous number of different settings, be it from security settings having to do with allowing users to change information in the PDF, uh, down to embedding fonts, <clears throat> other font configuration, uh, image compression, and so on and so forth. We indicate here that we want to use the XFO settings.xml file, which again is in this very same directory. And what does that file look like? I already have it open. Quite simple. Uh, we simply say within the PDF settings element that the EPS processor that should be used is ghost script. And since that's already on the path, Antenna House is able to use that directly. I believe you can also set it to distiller if you have that available. I don't know the advantages or disadvantages of distiller, but I know one advantage is that it's not free. Um, I don't know if it has particular advantages, but again, ghost script has worked very nicely for all of our clients. Once we include this attribute here, and we run integrator to integrate this plugin into our Ditto OT, um, and for those of you who may not have written a plugin, all you do is within the default Ditto OT directory, you simply type ant-f integrator.xml, and that essentially plugs in your plugin. If you're using some CMSs like Trisoft, for example, it may automatically run integrator every time you publish, which means that all you need to do is copy this directory, this com.suitesol EPS PDF, into your Ditto OT plugins directory, and then publish, and it'll automatically take effect. Um, once you do that, Antenna House will be able to use GhostScript to render EPS images. So let's take a look at what that looks like. First, let's see what it would look like if we weren't using GhostScript. Second, just opening up the file here. Sorry. Okay. 
if we did not have GhostScript installed together with this entire plugin, what you would see is something that looks like this in place of your EPS image. Uh, let me zoom in a little so you can see what this looks like. Uh, hopefully that's clear to you even through GoToWebinar. What you can see is that this looks pretty poor. <laughs> um, on the next page of this PDF, I have the JPEG just for comparison's sake, but uh, trust me when I tell you that this looks even worse than the JPEG. Um, there's, I don't know the graphical term for this, I think it's perhaps dithering. Um, what we're seeing here is what we mentioned before, the bitmapped preview image that's included within the EPS file. And Ten House without GhostScript cannot render the vector-based image that's in the EPS, so it does its best. It renders the bitmapped preview image, which usually is of a pretty poor quality because there's no reason to include two high quality images within the same file. So this is just to give you an idea of what you would be seeing if things were working properly. And they're not working properly. So this looks pretty poor. Um, once we incorporate all the code that I mentioned, what we end up with instead is this EPS, this PDF with this EPS graphic. Um, and as you can see here, if I zoom in, This is the actual PDF. Um, and again, when I zoom in, you can, say, you can see that things remain infinitely sharp, infinitely zoomable. And again, the advantages of such a feature, if you're using your PDFs for printing, are, should be clear to anyone, um, especially if you have complex schematics and, and the like where things really need to be sharp and people need to be able to zoom in and see the detail. Uh, having that functionality um, is, is a big win for, for uh, online viewing as well as printing. Um, I see that Kevin asked the question of, do you think scalable vector graphics SVG will likely replace EPS as a vector? Oh, there we go. Okay, as a vector image format in the near future. It seems like adoption is slow. Uh, that's a good question. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of this, and, and I certainly don't like to make predictions. I don't really have a, a big enough picture of the industry to accurately predict. Uh, but what I can say based on, based on our experience is that SVG adoption is picking up. You're right, it is slow. For those of you who may not know, SVG is another vector graphic format, uh, essentially kind of trying to achieve the same thing as EPS. It has an interesting advantage in that it's actually an XML file. You can open it up in a text editor and make changes right there. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, you wouldn't want to create something like this in Notepad, but you could in theory. Um, and uh, one of the advantages, another advantage of SVG is that the file size is generally much smaller. Um, and in terms of adoption, we have seen SVG adoption picking up both among our customers as well as among the tool set. Um, as I've mentioned, Browsers and Antenna House and FOP do not support EPS. Antenna House does support SVG out of the box. No extra work necessary. FOP does support SVG. Um, Mark Griffin says, Mark Giffen, sorry, says uh, it supports it pretty well. Um, I haven't seen instances where there are issues with it, but you know, as with any tool, there might be some um, incompatibilities and, and uh, details that it might not support certain newer features of SVG. And browsers are beginning more and more to support SVG. Certainly those of you who are still on IE6 or IE7 are not going to see support. Um, but Safari, Chrome, I think newer versions of IE do support SVG. So I think adoption is picking up. I think that, you know, give it time, it seems to be heading in the direction that SVG will replace EPS. Um, Kevin mentions we are experimenting with translating text and SVG images using World Server which as I mentioned, since SVGs are XML based, you can go in to the SVG file and replace English text with Spanish text. And now you have a new image. You have a Spanish SVG instead of an English SVG and that's just editing text. That doesn't necessarily always work as well in practice as it sounds like it would in theory because the Spanish words may be longer than the English words. And, or certainly with German, the words would be longer. And then the little rectangle that the words used to fit in they don't fit in anymore, so you need to make the rectangle bigger, and then you can't use a text editor for that so much anymore. So it's, it's a theoretical advantage. Practice doesn't always necessarily work out 
quite as well, but it certainly is possible. Uh, Joan asks if SVG images have a preview feature. Uh, they don't, but they don't necessarily need it. Um, as we mentioned, the purpose of the preview feature for EPSs was for machines or software that are unable to render the original image. Um, that's really not the case so much anymore. Machines certainly can. Um, you know, I'd say any reasonably modern machine can render it. And the software, as we said, is really picking up more and more. Uh, the whole the whole format itself is relatively new. So you wouldn't really find a piece of software that doesn't know how to support the, the vector-based format, but would be able to support the preview. Um, so th there is no preview feature, but it hasn't proved to be necessary in any way. So that tells us how we incorporate EPS images into our PDFs. Again, just to review, we create the plugin that tells Antenna House to use a configuration file that tells Antenna House to use GhostScript as the EPS engine for, uh, for rendering EPSs. And once we do that, Antenna House, as usual, again, this doesn't add any steps to the processing. Um, it just gives Antenna House one more tool in its toolbox uh, to be able to properly render EPS images. It's still just Antenna House that's actually converting the FO file into the PDF file. Any more questions about PDF before we move on to, to uh, HTML? Okay, then let's continue. <clears throat> uh, that covers PDF. For HTML, as I mentioned, EPS images are not supported in any browsers, at least without a plugin, and you certainly don't want your users to have to install a plugin in order to be able to view your content. It's generally not feasible to expect everyone to do that. So again, here we call to GhostScript for the rescue. The procedure here is going to be a little bit different. Um, as we saw, we can use Antenna House to create a PDF that includes a vector-based, infinitely zoomable EPS. That simply is not going to work with browsers. Browsers do not support EPSs we're not going to be able to gain those advantages of EPS images inside a browser, again, without a plugin, uh, which I'm assuming is not feasible. If it's feasible for you, great. Uh, but assuming it's not, then the best approach here is to actually use GhostScript to on the fly <clears throat> convert all EPS images into PNG images, or you, know, you can use whatever format you want. We found PNG to work the best here. Um, and then rewrite all the links to point to the new PNG counterpart instead of the original EPS. So again, for each and every EPS image that you have in your content, we'll be converting the EPS to a PNG, and then the HTML file that used to try to include uh, graphic.eps is now going to include graphic.png instead. Um, as opposed to PDF, this does add steps to the processing. It's not just adding another tool in the toolbox for Antenna House. It's adding these separate steps that now we need to call GhostScript separately as a separate step in the processing to convert each and every image. And that takes time, of course. Uh, but this gives us the advantage that you can still, you can have the benefits of EPS in your PDF and you don't need to manually create a separate PNG file for your HTML output. Your data content still refers to the EPS image and therefore it still works great for your PDF. But when you publish it to PDF, when you publish it, excuse me, to HTML, it's going to use the PNG counterpart instead. As I mentioned, the image is no longer going to be vector-based. It's not going to be infinitely zoomable, but that's okay generally speaking, because if you're dealing with a web page, people don't generally infinitely zoom into their web pages. Um, and they generally don't print their web pages into uh, a hardcover bound manual that's going to be included uh, in, with, the, with the product. The, the main advantage of EPS, as I said, is when it comes to printing, and that's generally not relevant to HTML. So what we just need to be able to do is to use the same data and the same image for your PDF and the HTML and we can achieve that with this approach, which we'll take a look at. Just before I get to that, 
I'll mention briefly that a similar approach of on-the-fly conversion and then rewriting links can also be used for SCG images, not using GhostScript, using a different tool, um, either Go, um, excuse me, Inkscape, Inkscape or Batik. Um, those can also convert SVG images. It's a similar mechanism, but slightly different tools that will also work for SVG images in case you need to support browsers that don't yet support SVG images. Let's take a look at the code. Again, looking at the <clears throat> plugin, we basically have three files plus a library, and I'll get to soon what that jar is used for. And again, as with any good plugin, we start with plugin.xml. And here there are two extension points that we're plugging into. Um, truth is, they should probably be in the other order, just uh, for the sake, not that it matters whatsoever from a technical perspective, but just uh, from a logical perspective. We'll start with integrator.xml, where again, we're going to customize some of the ant tasks and targets that are part of the did OT and, uh, and add a few of our own. Um, let's take a look at that. Starting from the top, um, right now we'll talk about the publishing XHTML. Uh, the same would be true of HTML help or any other HTML output format that you wanted to customize. But here, because we want to customize XHTML, we override the data to XHTML target. And we've made one change here that depends for those of you who may not be familiar with ant is basically saying that when processing your data into XHTML, first initialize, then pre-process, then uh, process the map for XHTML, copy the CSS. Each of these are other ant targets that get called in sequence, which in turn may call others. And at the end of the sequence, we've added one of our own, which we called find EPS. And as you can see right underneath, what find EPS does essentially in, in plain English is it finds every EPS image that's present in our output directory. It literally looks at the file system. It doesn't depend on what's referenced by the data. It literally looks at the file system. And for each of those calls, another ant target, which we'll get to in a second. This is where we need that library that I mentioned, this uh, jar that's in there, um, the for each ant target is not part of the basic ant list of tasks, but it's part of this ant contrib dash, no, this is the version number, ant contrib is uh, extra ant targets. So we need this jar in order to be able to go through each and every EPS image. And what we're saying here is, it sort of works outwards. For every EPS file that's in our output directory, we want to pass that file path in as a parameter named param, you can really call it whatever you want, to the ant target convert EPS to PNG. Um, once we're done with that, what we've chosen to do here is delete all the EPS files. As I mentioned, EPS files can tend to be large. If you're generating HTML, then once you've converted them to PNGs, there's no reason to keep those big EPS files lying around anymore. So we delete all the original EPSs. Um, again, you can choose to keep them there for archiving purposes if you want to, but there's functionally no need for them. What does convert EPS to PNG do? That's the new target that we've written down here. Uh, it takes in this param, this parameter named param, and from that first it figures out the base name of the file. So for example, if we had myimage.eps, uh, then we figure out that the, the, really the name of the image is my image. It strips off the .eps. Uh, it figures out the name of the directory where that image currently is. Um, again, this is more or less relevant if you're using some CMSs like Trisoft that flatten everything into one directory. Um, then we could just know where, the, where all the images are going to be. But, uh, but certainly if you have a nested directory structure, your images, your EPS images might be anywhere within your output directory. And we need to know where they are so we can make sure to put the resulting PNG into the same directory. <clears throat> I've chosen to output a message that's going to just let us know that it's converting the EPS file into the PNG file. And then we go ahead and, and actually call GhostScript. Again, here we execute the executable 
Again, I've hard coded the path because this is where I have it installed. Uh, note specifically the GSWin32. If you're running a 64-bit version, that executable name is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and again, if you want to make this more generic to try to determine what version of GhostScript you have installed and what directory it's in, go ahead. Uh, it's probably going to take more time than it's worth if you're just working for one client. Um, <coughs> you'll know what they have installed. You'll be able to override that for them. Uh, of note is the fact that I've set the time out here to, I think this is two minutes. Uh, we had some of our clients experiencing issues where certain corrupted ghost script uh, EPS files were causing this process to hang and their publishing never finished. Um, so we set a timeout on this executable. This timeout is a feature of Ant that you can set a timeout where if this conversion from EPS to PNG for any single image takes longer than two minutes, then just move on, forget it. Um, so we call this executable, we pass in a number of different parameters. Um, most of these, you know, here we, we say that we want to convert it to a PNG with 16 mil million colors. These settings have to do with alpha, alpha bits, alpha channels uh, for transparency that relates to anti-aliasing. Significant here, the dash R is the resolution, the DPI. Obviously, if we're dealing with a vector-based image that is infinitely zoomable, when we convert that to a PNG, we can make it come out as, you know, filling up your full screen or being, you know, a, an eighth of your screen. Um, we can zoom it in, zoom it out as much as we want to and convert it to the PNG at that size. So we tell GhostScript what DPI we want it to assume here. Um, 72 is relatively standard, 96 would be another option. Uh, the larger the DPI, the larger the image is going to come out. The smaller the DPI, the smaller it's going to come out. Um, you can play with that to figure out what works best for you. And then here we pass in the name of the output file, what we want the PNG to be named after its output, giving it the directory, the original name, myimage.png, and then we pass in the, the full path of the EPS. What all of this does together is at the end of your data OT processing, it's going to invoke this ant code that will look in your output directory recursively anywhere in your output directory in sub, 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 sub directories, and will convert every single EPS file to a PNG file. Um, when it's doing this, by the way, if you run this on your own machine, there's a little screen that pops up, a little white screen. Um, it's a, like some sort of a dialog box. You don't need to do anything. It'll disappear and, and you know, it pops up for each and every image. It'll disappear on its own for all of those. Um, once all of that processing is done, all of our EPSs will be PNGs, but all of our original data and therefore the output HTML will still be looking for myimage.eps. How do we change that? How do we get it to look for the PNGs that we've converted into rather than the original EPSs? So for that, we have the other half of our plugin, which is uh, eps.xsl, which we're incorporating into our XHTML XSL processing. And again, this is quite short. What we're saying here is that, again, sort of working our way backwards, for every href attribute of every image that ends off with .eps, rather than outputting the actual href attribute as the source, as the SRC for that image, we want to, uh, what this essentially does is it replaces the .eps with the .png. Um, and this XSL will, as part of, the, again, this doesn't add any steps to the processing. This is just as part of your regular XSL processing. When, your X, when this XSL processing is applied, if your original data referred to myimage.eps, the output HTML will refer to myimage.png. And the conversion will take care of making sure that myimage.png is sitting there in the right directory. When you piece all of that together, your HTML files will have a converted version of the, H, of the EPS image available for them for rendering. And that's going to look like this. Uh, this was originally the EPS graphic that we saw. You'll see if I zoom in that this is not infinitely zoomable because now it's a PNG instead of an EPS. But again, most web graphics are not infinitely zoomable. Um, and, uh, and therefore we gain the advantage of being able to use the same EPS images which offer us 
huge advantages for PDF. We can use those same images for our HTML and not have to worry about the lack of browser compatibility. And that's how we do it for HTML output. Um, that brings us to the end of the, of the HTML output format um, portion of this webinar, uh, as well as the end of the webinar itself. Um, any questions about HTML publishing in particular, uh, or PDF publishing for EPS, or, or anything else? Um, no one's chiming in, so uh, I'll take that as a no. If you do have any questions that come up later, uh, please feel free to be in touch. My email address is, <clears throat> excuse me, right there on the screen, ruvainw at suisal.com. Uh, again, please feel free to be in touch with any questions about this. We're happy to help. Uh, if you need help implementing this, we're, we're also happy to help. Um, if you need help doing more than that, then uh, we'll talk about a budget and, and scoping and estimates, and, and we're happy to help with anything. Um, thank you for your time. Again, the code will be made available. Um, and uh, have fun with your EPSs.